positive perspective in dire situations, leaning on those around you, and finding strength in yourself and your community. And so without further delay, I'll call your attention forward. And without uh, any further delay, please welcome Joey Jones. still coming and, and to do this memorial this morning and, and hear their names but 
not hear someone else's name added to it. Um, I haven't been in probably since 2014 or 15 because honestly it was just difficult to do. And uh, the first year that wasn't going to be one of the guys I knew, I took that opportunity to take a step back and kind of let the next generation happen. So here we are back. My, my wife Meg is here. My son Joseph is here for the first time in probably 10 years. And um, this morning was a moment, a life-changing moment for me. To be there and to hear those names and to know that this is a moment of reunion as much as remorse or sorrow. Uh, to hug the necks of Gold Star moms that I may not have met yet, but I knew their son well. And to hear them say, hey, I love watching you on TV. <laughs> um, first of all, for those of you that don't know, I, I work with Fox News Channel. Uh, I host there. If you're under 30 or live in an airport, it's like CNN, but different. <laughs> <laughs> Small, my gunner, and big. Everything else you can convince me. <laughs> but, to, but to be here this morning and, and meet some Gold Star families that I knew of their son, or I knew their son, and to have them say that. You know, the, the truth is, if you're an EOD tech and you're on television, to a certain set of this group, you're already a bad guy, right? You screwed up. You know something wrong. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it's funny, but it's true, you know? And so, I didn't get into television as an EOD tech, but man, I'm so proud to be a Marine EOD tech on television. Not because I want to represent you all, but because whether I want to or not, in some way I do. Because I wear this badge proudly. It's a basic badge, like I said. I wasn't that good at it. <laughs> and so, to be welcome here tonight, honestly, I came out here on pins and needles. Because I just don't know. I don't know how this field thinks about having one of their own on television, espousing opinions that are divisive sometimes. Never on purpose. I love this country more than I love any issue. Um, but to be welcomed here and to have people that I'm sure don't even share my politics come up to me and say, thank you for representing us well. If I had these, I'd be weak, you know. <laughs> it's humbling. And so as I'm thinking about what I want to talk about tonight, the truth is normally when I, when I talk to a crowd, I'm talking, I'm giving my story, my war story, and what I consider to be the more important part of my recovery story. And in front of this group, giving a war story like you would be asleep. You've got one back. <laughs> You've got one that you, <laughs> that you kept your legs through. You know? <laughs> and so that's not the right message for tonight, but some of that... It's how I learned what I want to talk about. So I'm going to hit a little bit of it, but the first thing I want to bring up is my father-in-law is a Vietnam veteran. And he didn't talk about his service until I got hurt. And he was around the military and he was around veterans again. And it was the first time he knew he could be proud of his service. And I just want you to take a moment to look around. This happens every year. We are so proud of our service. And we are honored in this country for our service by anyone that matters. We are told we can be proud, we should be proud. We are told it's not the warrior's fault if the war is political. We are proud of our service. And it's because those generations before us, especially that Vietnam generation, that didn't have that opportunity, was so selfless and so wise that they kept this country and made this country better for us so that when we picked up the mantle and fought our 20 year war, we never knew anything but being proud of our service. You know, I, I say this in a room full of military people, so it's a little bit different now, but people tell them up to me and they say, thank you for your service. And I don't want to take credit for it. Ostensibly, I'll accredit whomever I heard say it first. But when they say thank you for your service, it's hard to know what to say back. And eventually I understood the best thing to say back is thank you for being worth serving. And so what, what does that mean? Why is that important? It's important because, in my opinion, we live in the greatest country in the world. And I'm not up here just, yeah, I'll take it. I mean, like when I say we live in the greatest country in the world, 
you know, I've, I've had a chance to, you know, go to other places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, I mean, Europe came here. That's why we exist. So it's not any better, you know. And so we live in the greatest country in the world. It's crazy when you give me the other education, we pull stuff out anyway. You know? And so we live in the greatest country in the world. But it's not because of the, the strength of our military or the size of our economy or our free system of government. If you if you watch me on TV, I'm not telling you all those things are a little bit in question. It's the greatest country in the world because we're the only country like us. We're the most prosperous country in the world that did it completely differently than society had ever said was possible. We have fought for freedom and equality in this country since the day we started. And by all means, it took too long to get there for some obvious groups of people. And for some of you that, that feel like we're not there, I understand that. But we get up every morning and we want to be there and we try to be there. We live in a country that's made up of people that speak different languages, eat different foods, pray to different gods, pray in different ways, vote differently. But when, but when we go out in the morning and we see someone stumble, we don't think about those things. We don't know what their politics are. We don't know what service they were in. We know that that's a human being that's in need of help. And for some reason, we need to do this together, and it's the only way it gets done. So what do we do? We walk over there, we pick them up, we dust our back off. We say, you're going to get through this. When I was injured in 2010, it was my first deployment as a school trained EOD tech. I'd gotten to OJT a few years before when I put my package in because, you know, Iraq, you know, outside had nightclubs, so of course you could do paperwork there. <laughs> and so I'd known of U of E in a little bit more of an intimate way before school. Went to school down here, lived here for a year. Went to Camp Milton, California, first U of E company. Some of us might say America's U of E team. And I just go, you know, there we go. I got to go. I, have to, I got to give the dirty dudes the first company uh, a nod while I'm here. If you want to know why we're the dirty deuce, we'll talk about that later. But, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I go out there and I, and I learn from these men and women who had just gotten back from Afghanistan in 2008. They get back in 2009. It's like, hey, by the way, you're going again in 10. We don't know when, so you go ahead and get ready. And so you learn about, as, as, as a young EOD tech, you learn about what not to do and you learn about what to do, just like our parents. And, and so for me, the humbling nature of being here is that I got to see firsthand the service and sacrifice it takes to wear this badge and to protect this country. And how beautiful it is. I couldn't tell you their politics. I take you invite a diverse group of people just on our hobbies. I mean, some of us like, you know, some of us, our hobby was how many DUIs can you get, you know? <laughs> get this bus driver fired today. <laughs> and so the, to serve in the Marine Corps and in the EOD field in a time of war was something that when you're living it, you don't know what it's going to mean in 10 years, and now we do. You go back to the first company and you meet EOD techs, and, and they don't know what that's like. And hell, I'm glad. I don't want them to. They don't know what it's like to put a friend on the wall to have friends lose their legs and see that as their own fate. But we live in a place that after 20 years of that, our sons and daughters are still signing up to do it. Not just join the military, but to join the military and become an EOD tech. And so, you know, I, I do work in politics and I get this a lot of times. Yeah, I don't think I could let my son or daughter join the military right now. The way things are, that's the way people say, in the nicest way possible, I have zero faith in our government and leaders. Yep. They say the way yeah. things are. So we have, we have one of those leaders here this morning. He might be here tonight. I'm not taking a stance on that right now. But what I am saying is people are concerned about it. And they genuinely, and, and not in a selfish way, say, I don't think I can send my sons and daughters to, to be in the military right now. And that just blows my mind. And I say, well, why is that? I say, well, you know, just some of the policies. And, okay, and they're like, really, it's just, you know, the people, the leaders right now, they don't have their mind right. They're not focused correctly. They're not, they're worried about this instead of that. And I say back to them, well, if you believe that to be true, 
that today the leaders aren't good enough and you keep your sons and daughters home, who's left to lead? What are we leaving our beloved military to? If you don't like something, you fight for it. If you don't like the way things are, you fight for it. You don't give up on it. So no matter what your politics are or whatever your perspective is, and I've had that conversation with somebody last time that made me in this room, and I understand what he's talking about, but I don't feel the same way, and this is why. I love the Marine Corps. I loved being an EOB tech. I love being a retired Marine. And an EOB tech that wasn't that great. <laughs> That guy blown up that blow take my badge away. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> God, what shit going on out there? <laughs> so I come here today, and one of the first things that was said to me when I walked in tonight was, Welcome home. Yeah. Ooh. say to Vietnam veterans because they didn't hear it enough. So I had to think for a minute, what do they mean welcome home? They're talking about welcome here to the Mecca of EOD. And for so many of us, this is where it starts to where it ends. For some of us, that ends in a twilight tour. For others, it's retirement. For others, it's the last place we wear our uniform on active duty. And for a select few, it ends in the way of being put on a wall. And our families come to see it. And that's where I take issue. Because it doesn't end. This is where the journey of being an active duty EOD tech begins and ends. But this community in this room right now, this community is represented by folks that couldn't be here tonight, that is coast to coast, top to bottom. This is home, but it's not home because it's a beach or it's in Destin or Okaloosa. It's home because of the people that are here and the events that happened this week and the wall that stands over there through rain or shine and the fact that that schoolhouse is continuing to make amazing people better and testing them to their wits end and testing them in a way that you've got to make an 85 or better to pass makes no sense at all. <laughs> It's home because no matter how many, how much things change, they stay the same. It's home because 10 years later, we see faces of people that we might not have even liked when we were serving with them. And with 10 years of wisdom, we give them a smile and a hug and we say, man, it's good to see you. It's home because the honest to God's truth is there is no way to tell anybody what this job is and how it's done. Nobody, you are, you're not the unsung heroes of this war. You're the unknown heroes of this war. Because even when we sing the praise, there's only a select few of us that really understands this job. Yet we, we embrace that to the point we don't want people on TV. <laughs> to the point that we charge beer when they do. We embrace the fact that if you come in this job looking for glory, you're going to get somebody hurt. If you come in this job looking to be a hero, you're going to get somebody hurt. And so what term do we use for that? Well, in true beauty fashion, I couldn't get a consensus today, so I brought both. The lonely walk, the long walk. I don't know. It, the long walk is what I heard. And for those of you that might not understand, and for those of you that do, it's this idea that when there's an ID or a piece of ordinance that needs to be rendered safe, the team leader walks by his or her stuff down. Maybe in a bomb suit, maybe not. Maybe after a robot, maybe it's in a flag jacket, a helmet with some trauma shears like we were doing more than we should. And this idea, this is the lonely walk, the lonesome walk, the long walk. You're, the idea is you're doing it by yourself. And the belief is, you know, you're sending one EOB tech down, so if something goes wrong, no, nobody else gets hurt. That's our job, right? That if this IED takes a casualty, it's only going to be me. Right? That's, our, that's it. And so we have this culture that we don't mean to create that tells us, 
We're on this journey by ourselves. And I absolutely take issue with that. This is not a lonesome journey. This is not a long journey. When you're walking down range, aside from your team members that are there with their eyes on you, helping you not get tunnel vision, there are dozens of mentors and teachers and leaders who have given you the knowledge and experience through training to make that walk. They're with you. There are men and women who have paid the price of lessons learned in blood. You read the reports and you read about what, what went wrong for them. And you're using that to make the correct next literal step. They're walking with you and keeping you safe. And there are families at home that are on their knees praying, going to PTA meetings and football games and cheerleading camps and keeping that house alive. Whether it be your parents or your spouse or your kids, depending on your age and where you are in your career, they're with you when you're on that lonesome wall. And I bring that up tonight because I had too many conversations in the last 24 to 48 hours with men that still feel alone. And that's our job now. I often talk about what it would look like to be a warless core. And I worry about this. the Marine Corps look the same if it's without a war? Is that a necessary evil? Well, there are yogi techs in this room that are retired. There are yogi techs in this room that, that got out because they were tired but didn't retire. There are yogi techs in this room coming up on the end of their career. And there are yogi techs in this room that are starting it. And my message to you tonight is do not believe this is a lonesome journey. Do not accept loneliness as the best next step in your life. And I'm here to tell you, you can be on television and in front of crowds and be lonely. Look at those people that love you. Look at those people that expect something from you. Know that although your mission may change, it doesn't go away. As a matter of fact, it becomes more important when you're not the one doing it and you're the one mentoring the one doing it. And that's not just this job, that's life. See, when I was injured, there was a Marine engineer that was with me. Now I'm from Georgia. We do good football there. No dogs. Hey, listen, a year ago that joke hit hard, okay? <laughs> I'm from Georgia. I'm an active duty Marine. I'm an EOD tech. And God, with a sense of humor, puts this guy that's from Tennessee, a big balls fan. He's, he's, uh, he's an engineer and he's a reservist. And he puts him right in front of me and says, that's going to be your best bud. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, I got more in common with the Taliban than this dude. Like, <laughs> So I meet this guy, Daniel Greer from Tennessee. We become bad, fast buds. And, you know, he had, he had been married for a while. He had had a, um, a son for a while. And I, I just reconnected with my high school girlfriend, who's now my wife. There we go. And my son was not, not a year old, right yet. So I really hadn't had a chance to be a dad yet. If that order confuses you, hey, I'm bringing you a detail. And so, and so I was just starting my family, but I've been in Afghanistan for six months. He had been a full-time fireman for years. He's about my age. And he had had his family for a little while. And he was just starting his career as a marine engineer. And he had just been there for a couple months. So he mentored me on life, and I mentored him on how to stay alive. And it was a great friendship. And so when I was injured, I told you, I'm going to tell you the worst story. When I was injured, I stepped on an IED. I, my team leader had, had moved a piece of uh, recovered ordinance. I thought from school I knew something that he didn't. I went over to check it out. He had walked away. Daniel stood near me to provide overwatch because we hadn't seen what was over here. We were afraid that there would be snipers while we were working. 
And so when I took this step right, we had cleared this area multiple times. I stepped on an ID and blew it up, took my legs. That part's, you know, whatever. And so I looked down and Daniel's laying on his belly. He's looking back at me and he's not all that messed up. Like he just looks knocked out, you know. So I, I'm, I'm getting her done over here, you know. Like I got a punch of lung and legs are gone and this arm looked like that scene in Harry Potter is just flipping around, you know. And I'm glad I got to laugh out of that because when the crowd's older, they don't have a clue. <laughs> And so they, they come in, they do triage, they take Daniel out first, and that's always my understanding, like, take the worst first, unless the worst doesn't make it, you know, and I'm like, well, I don't know. My lips felt, they were like, blown open from the inside out. Ladies, I'm full syringe, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say anything serious from working too soon. <laughs> I said that joke in Palm Springs, California, got beat up. <laughs> Even the men do look at that That was a little weird. <laughs> and so they take Daniel off the battlefield. They roll by and they're like, hey, we got a heavy breather. And, I'm, and, and, and in my mind, I guess I was thinking mouth breather. I'm like, why are you not talking shit about this guy? And, we just got up. and they run off with Daniel, you know. And, and they, they keep working on me. Marine gets to me. He's working on me. And I remember thinking my arm was all messed up. I remember thinking, you know, they took us to this pig course before we deployed a live tissue course. And they're like, yeah, when the... When the <laughs> Bunch of Navy guys. When the when the flesh is all burned up, just cut the burnt part away and get all that MRSA and stuff out of there. It's like you're telling a bunch of Marines to cut flesh. Do you know what you're doing right now? I remember thinking, God, I'd love there to be a doc, you know. And so so I'm laying on the battlefield, my arms all messed up, and I see it, and I'm thinking, you know, my legs aren't much to write home about, but I kind of like my arms, and I want to keep this one. So I threw it on my belly, and in my mind, I'm hiding it from the Marines. <laughs> And so we get through this, and the ring is there, and he doesn't know what to do with tourniquets. He hadn't been there very long. And, um, and so finally, all this man just said the Lord's Prayer with me. So we're like, you know, Father, who art in heaven, and there's a pause, it's like, well, liberty and justice for all of them. <laughs> Now, the only reason I said anything has to get this part, because this is the part I do want to tell you about. And so I wake up in Marshall, Germany, a couple days later, and I, I know I'm going over, but I'm from Georgia, so it's just, it is what it is. It takes us five minutes to say I'm from Georgia. So, so I wake up in Marshall, Germany, and they wake me up. It's, it's a difficult thing. I'm, my mouth is dry. They, they won't let me drink water. If any nurses in the room or angels, they're also a little bit evil. So I'm circling my mouth with this thick and sponge and water. And I'm like, lady, y'all, you know, waterboard me. I don't got to be there. You can have the cheese pop. I'm like, I, I, I need water right now. I'm like, let's make this happen. And she's just going around my lips. And so finally enough of that water gets into my mouth that I can talk. And I don't think anything about what I'm about to say. I think maybe they like zap you when they wake you up. I mean, they get you some energy there to begin with because it doesn't last long. And so I can talk and I want to get some words out. So finally enough of that water gets into my throat and it breaks up. And the first thing I said was, where's Greer? And I didn't mean to. It's just what my mind is. The last thing I saw was the first thing I thought about when I woke up. This is August 6th. When we got hurt, August 8th is when I woke up. It's two days later. And the nurse looks at me. She puts that cup down and she comes back and she smiles. And in response to my question of where's Greer, she goes, don't worry, hon, you're going to walk again. And so the truth is Daniel Greer was two or three doors down. I took this right step, I stepped on an ID. He was too close. A piece of that wall that was next to me flew in front of me and hit him in just the right spot. Took his brain activity. And so the truth was Daniel Greer was a few doors down and either had just or was about to have his family say goodbye and his mom and wife were going to take him off life support and let his body go on. And I bring that up for a couple reasons. One, because this crowd more than any understands how I feel about that. And I'll get to that in a second. But most importantly, I bring it up because that nurse had this wisdom and this understanding. What she knew well, she could tell me what I was asking to hear. And that's a gamble. How will I respond to that? Will I carry that guilt? Will I give up? Will I ever walk again knowing I stepped on an ID that took a man's life? Or she could tell me what I needed to hear 
when I needed to hear it, even when that wasn't what I was asking to hear. She changed the trajectory of my life forever by telling me, don't worry, honey, you're going to walk again. So as I went through my recovery, and the most senior EOD tech in the Marine Corps and his wife come break me out of Walter Reed so I can have a couple of hours of normalcy. And this whole field descends upon Walter Reed and Bethesda because we take care of our own like no others. Organizations spring up. Places are built for us to go retreat. People start mobilizing and, and, we're, and they thank you for your service and they take care of you and they put you back together. And no matter how difficult and surmountable that was, thanks to her words and the actions of the people in this room, in large part, Thinking about anything other than I'm going to walk again was not an option. Who the hell was I to prove these people wrong that believed in me so much? And so I say that tonight to go back to my message. It's not a lonesome walk. It's not a lone walk. It's not a lonesome journey. I don't know what you came here tonight to hear or what questions you're asking. Many of you have asked me about politics. But I hope I'm telling you what you need to hear and when you need to hear it. I'm glad we didn't put anybody on the wall today. But there are, I think, 20 Gold Star families here tonight. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of folks in this room tonight about to retire or leave. There are hundreds of others who came back just for this, and many of this is their first time in a while. What I'm telling you tonight, what you need to hear, is that this is not a lonesome journey. And that's not just because you should know people are here for you. It's because you still have the responsibility to be there for them. We owe that to each other. If there's anything I learned in my recovery, is that responsibility is the greatest gift in the world because when all of those motivational quotes go out the window, knowing you owe something to somebody that only looks to you to do it is the greatest motivation you could ever have. Whether you're a father, a mother, a daughter, a son, a friend, a boss, an employee, a mentor, a mentee, whatever it is, in your church, your workplace, your family, your group, your motorcycle club, there are people in your life that look at you and say, that's the person that can do this thing. That's who I can depend on for this thing. That responsibility should absolutely crawl up your spine and come out looking like Tony Robbins. <laughs> if I could jump, I would, right? You know, like, this is me, I would. <laughs> Take those responsibilities that stress you out and remind yourself how great of a gift that is, how amazing of a thing that is, and then go remind your buddy. Go tell your buddy that's gray and he's got the beard and he's been out for two years and you're like, you can't grow that in two years. What happened? And he's moved off to the woods and he got his cabin and his 40 acres. He doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody and say, no, you're not. You're not running away from me. I'm not running away from you. We need to be here for each other. We need to be here for these families that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And we need to be here for the men and women in this room who are about to or have just gotten their back so they don't forget what this job means, what this community is, and that this sacrifice is absolutely worth it because this country is a country worth serving. This time, man, they got a rod over here with a hook on it. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. People look at me and they have admiration because I lost my legs and I didn't give up. I look at this room and I think it's crazy. I don't know what it's like to lose a son or a daughter. I don't know what it's like to have cancer. I don't know what it's like to lose my house, my business, to go through a messy divorce. I don't know what it's like to lose faith in a lot of ways. 
And all those things are probably at every table in this room right now. If it's not happening to you, it's happening to someone you love, and that's worse. But here you are. In your uniform, in your suit, in your tux, in your ball gown, looking beautiful, sounding awesome, still sober. That's an amazing thing. <laughs> here you are celebrating. Here you were last night giving money to a cause that you believe in. Here you are surviving. Here you are thriving. So whatever adulation or adoration you have for me or those like me, like my buddy Andrew right here, man, it's like Miss Morland lives in me and out shoots me every time. I don't Listen, whatever adulation or adoration you have for us, I appreciate it. At some point, we earned it in some way. But look in the mirror tomorrow morning and exercise that gift to tell somebody what they need to hear when they need to hear it. Pat yourselves on the back and be that America that's worth serving because that's what I believe each and every one of you are. God bless y'all. Hey, listen, real quick, I always try to tell a funny story before I leave, and I want to tell this one because it's a good one for right now. In 2012 or 13, I was at the White House having dinner with President Obama and 34 of, at the time, 36 four-star generals. All right, it's called the Combatant Commander's Dinner, and I was there for one reason and one reason only. I can bullshit, I don't have legs. <laughs> That's the only reason I was there. At the time, the Marine Corps did not know I was a, a verbal liability. <laughs> All right, they didn't know that I had political opinions and aspirations. And they said it would be a good idea to put this guy next to President Obama for a whole dinner. <laughs> and so Meg and I went, and we get into the room, and I'm going to tell this whole story. I don't normally tell the whole story, but this crowd deserves the whole story. So I go in there, and we go in the room, and none of the generals were there. At the time, there were no female four-star generals at the time, only male. So the reason why I bring that up is all the generals and the president were at, like, whiskey and cigar hour. And all the wives were at, like, dessert and champagne room. And I walk in there, and of course, like, I'm not going to go to Whiskey and Cigar Hour because I just don't have legs, and I'm both, like, I'm not a four-star general. And so I'm like, you know, joke's on you because I prefer dessert over whiskey anyway. <laughs> and so maybe I walk in, and there's one general in with the wives, and it's General Petraeus. And so for those of you that um, study this stuff, that was a bad week for him. <laughs> And so he walks up to me and he starts talking to me and he had thoroughly enjoyed the champagne bar. And so I have EGAs on, on my service uniform and he must have thought I was in the Navy because he kept trying to turn my anchor straight up and down. <laughs> Push my eagle at an up and that is unsat. Like if Mattis had rounded the corner, I would have died. <laughs> From the little laser beams, you know? And so I, I'm trying to work my way through this conversation and finally the general's coming in and I go, thank God, you know? Somebody else he can mess with, you know? But he was incredibly gracious and it was an, an out of this body moment for me as this humble Marine staff sergeant. So finally we get ushered into the White House or we get ushered into the dining room and I'm sure it's named after color. I don't know the White House that well, right? And so we get ushered into this room, we're having dinner and like you had Petraeus and Mattis and Mullen and McChrystal and all the heavy hitters were there, right? Well, you can't put all those guys at one table or it'll fall through the floor. You know? <laughs> there. So they had them scattered. You know, all your heavy hitters were at different tables. It was kind of cool that way. And you don't sit with your date. So even the wives work with their husbands and they let Meg and I stay together because I'm crippled, right? And so we're sitting there, the president's right here, we're, we're, he's elbow to elbow with me, he keeps pulling his phone, his blackberry out, and I'm thinking, oh man, I'm gonna see something I'm not supposed to, and I'm gonna like interrogate me, you know, or something. And, and so finally he checks back into the conversation and because of what had happened with General Petraeus that week and President Obama letting him know who the, who the boss was. All the generals at that table were pretty amicable. Like, the president could have said anything. Like, yes, sir, you're right, sir. That's the way we do it. You're right, sir. You know? And so the, the conversation was a little bland, you know, and finally they get into, this is 2000, I think, 12, so, right, midterms, you know, and so they get into, we're going to end this war. And we laugh at that right now, right? It took 10 more years to end this war. You know? and, and so they get into that conversation, and they're going around the table, and the president, to his credit, looks at me, and he goes, Johnny, Get in here. If you were back in Afghanistan doing the same thing you were doing in the same place, what would you do different? <laughs>
<laughs> Mr. President, on step left. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.